Hello and welcome to the Hot Rod Bible Study where tonight we are in Hosea chapter 11, which I feel is appropriate as we have been looking at people who are morally and spiritually bankrupt. And just as in chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, those who are in that protection are able to reorganize without fear of prosecution by those that they are indebted to. Interestingly enough, though, in God's economy, He takes on that debt. The one that we are indebted to pays the price for our debt to Him, pays the price for our sin. I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Jesus' final words on the cross where he says, it is finished. Uh, well, in the Greek, it's tetelestai, which means paid in full. So when Jesus died on the cross, he paid our debt, the one that we owe in full. So God's economy is greater <laughs> And it's a good thing because we are unable to pay that. We, we need that uh, ability to reorganize again, to come back to God, to turn our faces back to Him as opposed to being away from Him, such as the children of Israel that we've been reading about here. Again, I feel this is very appropriate for our time in our country. Uh, and, and this isn't this is a different time in our country than we've ever seen, but this is not a different time for countries in general. Uh, we go back to the fact that when there is a great spiritual awakening and people turn toward God, that they're being blessed, but then we become complacent, such as the children of Israel here, Come, become complacent, thinking we know all about it and we don't need God, and so we turn our backs on God. So, this is what... This entire book of Hosea has been about, it's been about uh, the Israelites' harlotry, uh, going with other gods, even though God has blessed them abundantly. Works for us today, too, because he does a work, he blesses us abundantly, too. Okay, with that, let's open with prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father. <laughs> Thank you so much for this time we're here together. Thank you for your presence with us this evening. Again, please open our hearts and our minds to your word. Thank you for your word that we are able to study it. And as always, Lord, keep me out of the way. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Okay, chapter 11, verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. As they called him, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refuse to repent. And the sword shall slash in his cities, devour his districts, and consume them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Atma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come with terror. They shall walk after the Lord. He 
will roar like a lion when he roars. And then his sons shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. Ephraim has encircled me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God, even with the Holy One who is faithful. Okay, that's where we're going to stop and see what God has for us here. Um, if, I hope you caught it, that throughout this chapter, God is speaking of the things that Israel has been doing, yet there it shows in verse, starting in verse 8, his love for his children. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit further here in just a little bit. Okay, verse 1 says, When Israel was like a child, was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. More than 500 years prior to this being written, God brought the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. You're probably familiar with that story. If you're not, you can read the book of Exodus and it'll tell you all about it. it talks about how God removed the children, his people, the children of Israel, out of slavery in Egypt. And then we see here further, though, as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. God called Israel out of Egypt, yet the idolatry of the Baals called to Israel. Isn't that a sad situation? Here God takes them out of slavery, and yet they answer to the idolatry of foreign gods. We can do the same thing. Verse 3 says, I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. I think about that just like a little kid. I uh, have had occasion to post some different pictures of my grandchildren today and yesterday as a challenge or whatever uh, uh, to post different pictures of the grandchildren. And I've been thinking about that, how you... Help the little kids walk by holding them by their arms. Same thing with my daughter, the grandchildren. And just a wonderful thing where you're helping them to be able to be stable and walk on their own. And that's what God is referring to that he has done with us, with his children, with, with Ephraim, the children of Israel. He has been able to teach them to walk, yet holding them the entire time. But it goes on in verse 3 to say, But they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with, with gentle cords and with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from the neck. I stooped and fed them. Okay. Drew them with gentle cords and bands of love. No coercion. No manipulation. Let me say that again. No coercion, no manipulation. Satan is the one who does that. He will make something look really good that is absolutely not good for us whatsoever. And that again is manipulation, manipulating, in, manipulating us away from the call of God. It says, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. Hey, we can understand that. Take that weight off. You know, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is light, God says. He stooped and fed them. He humbled himself. Matter of fact, humbled himself to the point of being made man here on earth for us. Humbled himself to the point of the cross. God blessed Israel, and he blesses us so abundantly that they did not recognize it, and we don't recognize it as well. It's a sad situation. Uh, you think about it. 
uh, people will say, I worked really hard for all that I got. Granted, okay. But who gave you the ability to do that? You know, who gave you the ability, who gave uh, Beethoven, when he was deaf, the ability to write symphonies that are so beautiful that they're still being played today? Who gave, uh, I, think, I think of racing car drivers. They, they would talk about uh, Fangio, who was a... Formula One driver in the 50s. So this was back when you could see, actually see the men that were handling these machines uh, because they weren't encompassed, in, encased in the racing car. And they said that Fangio looked like he was out for Sunday drive. Same thing was said for Sterling Moss. These men were blessed by God to have that ability. Yes, they did it, but if they were not given that ability, I certainly could not write a sonnet, okay? If God had not given them that ability, they could not have done such. So we don't do it all by ourselves. We are not uh, our own, uh, what, what the, whole, the whole deal of our own island or whatever like that. God has given each and every one of us the ability to do something and to do it well, okay? It's not on our own. Verse 5 says, He shall not be returned to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king. Uh, the Assyrian invasion, okay? He shall be his king. Why? It says, because they refuse to repent, when we turn our backs on God, refuse to repent of our sins, again, here, here it is. I say this often. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, if we repent, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what they did not do. Verse 6 says, And the sword shall slash in his cities. Again, the Assyrians are going to come in and drag them off into uh, exile. Okay. It says they will devour his districts and consume them. Why? Because of their own counsels. Trusting in man instead of trusting in God. Um, Christian author Frank Peretti, this guy I like to read, did, had a speech a number of years ago. <laughs> it was pointed out to me that, it was kind of interesting, some young whippersnapper, not dry behind the ears, fresh out of seminary, pointed out to me, well, that was awfully old when I... Uh, and showed him this, this speech that Frank Preddy made. And I thought, well, yeah, the Bible's not necessarily young either. But, but anyway, <laughs> but it was a number of years ago, and you can tell by what Frank's wearing and all that stuff. So what? The word is good. And one of the things that he says, oh, and by the way, it's called The Chair, and you can watch it on YouTube, Frank Peretti, the chair. You can watch it on YouTube. You can even purchase the DVD if you want. Show your friends and all. It is just a wonderful uh, exposition on faith. And one of the things that he says in this, and get this, he says, if you're looking for the truth, and again, we're talking about following man's advice and not being led by God. If you are looking for the truth, don't look within yourself because you're the one who's all messed up. Isn't that a great way to put it? Oh, I'll look within myself and I'll find the answer. No, you won't. You're the one that's messed up. Look towards God. Look in Scripture, which we're doing tonight. Praise Him that we are able to do that. Okay, so they were being devoured in their own districts. They're being consumed by the Assyrians. Why? Because of their own counsels, they sought man's advice and not God's advice. Verse 7 goes on to say that my people 
are bent on backsliding from me, though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. They are bent on backsliding from me. We've heard this before. Uh, Sarah Groves, uh, another Christian artist that I like, has a song. It's painting pictures of Egypt. I've been painting pictures of Egypt, leaving out what it lacks, because the future is so hard that I want to go back. You see, there are things that we think, oh, especially, especially new believers, oh man, keep all new believers, and if you're one, I keep you in prayer, because you become a new believer, and man, you are on fire for the Lord, and the next thing you know, Satan throws everything at you because <laughs> he doesn't want you to be a believer. And it's tough. And you go back to thinking, man, it was a lot easier painting pictures of Egypt, leaving out what it lacks. Because the future is so hard that I want to go back. Boy, it is worthwhile. Keep on. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Okay, verse 7 it continues saying, Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt Him. Calling out to God in prayer as a last resort. Well, I've tried everything else. Maybe I ought to try praying. Now, for those who are believers, we have a tendency to do that. Another song that I like says, I trust you, God, in the big things, but the little things I don't, which means I don't call on God in the little things like I ought. My lovely bride, Pam, does a lot better job of that than I do. I am still a stubborn old man. And I think, I don't need to pray for a parking place. Pam does, and she receives grace with that. Now, does that mean she gets one right up front? No, it might mean she gets a parking place way away from everybody else so the car doesn't get beat up. Yes, she's, I'm rubbing off on her a bit. But anyway, that's the deal. We need to trust in God, not just calling out on Him when there's trouble as a last resort and not honoring Him. See, that's the deal. People will call, oh, God, save me. And they do. And he says, oh, boy, I sure missed out on that. Boy, I sure dodged that bullet, didn't I? I. There's an I problem there. No, no. When you, when you honor God in everything that you do, things will go well. And when you have a tough time, God will be there by your side seeing you through. Okay. Now, Verse 8, this is showing how God loves the children of Israel, loves us as much. Because it says here, how can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? It's like giving up on your kids. You might want to do that. You might say, okay, I love you, but now guess what? You know, uh, you need to, you need to uh, feel the consequences for your actions. That's a tough thing as a parent to do, to not try and keep them away from. But at times it's the best thing. So that's what God is doing here. But he, how can I give up on you? He doesn't give up. He says, how can I make you like Adma? How can I, Adma, pardon me, how can I set you like Zeboim? Now these are two cities that may not be very familiar to you, but these are two cities that again are like Sodom and Gomorrah. They are mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Let me read you that. 29 verse 23 says of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 29, 23 says, the whole land is brimstone, salt and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, like Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. He is promising not to do the same. Just like seeing the, the rainbow, God's promise not to flood the world again. Reminder of that. Boy, we had one here just recently that was so beautiful. You could see end to end. Man, 
It was just absolutely, it, it made you glad. Well, it made you appreciate God's creation is really what it made you do. Okay. It goes on to say, God is saying, my heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. God heart, God's heart breaks for us when we turn our back on him. Just as the illustration that God had our hero Hosea go through with marrying a harlot, who in turn then, pardon me, sells herself off, and he has, God has Hosea by her back. Hosea's heart had to break, but yet he bought Gomer back. Hmm, same thing that God does with us. Verse 9 goes on to say, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am God, and this is key, and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. Okay? God is not like man. He is long-suffering, forgiving, and compassionate. Remember that. God is long-suffering, forgiving, and compassionate. A trait that I would like to be more like. A trait that I strive to be more like. But that's what God is. He is not, in His anger, going to take His wrath out. It says here, because I will not come in terror. Because God heart, God's heart truly breaks for the children of Israel in this instance and for us when we're doing the same thing and for our country. It sure seems to line up a lot with things going on in our country today. We have people who curse God uh, and with, with no thought. With, with, with no um, feeling of guilt, they're able to just go right ahead. And we see it, boy, we see it in the media, we see it in movies and all these things. And that breaks my heart. And if it breaks my heart, you know how much it's breaking God's heart. Here's my obligatory Spurgeon quote here says, suppose that someone had grievously offended any one of you and he asked you for your forgiveness. Do you not think that you would probably say to him, ah, oh, yes, I forgive you, but I can't forget it. it says, ah, oh, dear friends, that is a sort of forgiveness with one leg chopped off. It is lame, get that, lame forgiveness, and is not worth much. Oh my, isn't that something? Isn't that something to live up to? If we are to forgive like God forgives, forgive us our trespasses as, <laughs> as you forgive, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, so if we're to, to ask for forgiveness of our sins from God, we should also forgive those who sin against us and fully. <laughs> That's hard. Verse 10 goes on to say, They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. And they shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. Israel will be and was called back out of exile. Okay? It's kind of like, I always like this. That's what I love about the Old Testament. Couple, there's a couple of things. First of all, it shows, it shows that we have... Um, the great patriarchs of the Bible, right? Oh, man, you know, uh, we have uh, Abram. Well, he was a liar. <laughs> and he didn't trust God. 
well enough, okay? But although his faith was counted to him, right, as righteousness, we had David, a man after God's own heart, yet he was an adulterer and a murderer, okay? We have all these great uh, patriarchs and people in the Bible that God used in a mighty way. It gives us hope, man. It gives us hope. And that's what I like about the Old Testament. Also the fact that here we got God's blessing. God, God's blessing his people. And they say, yeah, God, you're our God. And you're, we're, you know, we're your people. And what happens? They get complacent and they turn their backs on God. Just as we do. Same thing. Verse 12 goes on to say, Ephraim has encircled me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God, even the Holy One who is faithful. You know what? There's the deal. God shows us His mercy even when we turn our backs on Him. Even when we fall into the various traps, even when, uh, okay, we go back to the beginning here, where Israel followed after the Baals. Why? Because Satan made it look really neato. Satan's not that guy on the Underwood deviled ham can with a, with a tail and the horns and all that kind of stuff. Satan does things that look good to us. Do you think that Eve would have been tempted by the serpent in the Garden of Eden if the serpent were ugly? No, he wasn't. <laughs> he was attractive to, to Eve, and that's why Eve listened to him. And what was Eve's sin? Here's another thing I'd, like, I'd really like to, to point this out. What was Eve's sin? Uh, was it eating the fruit? Most people say, well, it's eating the forbidden fruit. No, Eve's sin was wanting to be like God, not surrendering to God, but wanting to be like God, because that's what Satan told her that they would be if they just eat the fruit. You will be like God. God doesn't want you to be like him. No, God doesn't want you to be like him. God wants you to be his and his alone. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Again, this is the gospel to pay the price for our sin, for our turning our backs on God, just like the children of Israel here. Okay, at this point is when I always have to ask for questions, comments, or smart aleck remarks. Seeing none here this evening, and uh, again, reminding you, please, if you have any questions, again, I am a man. I am a man. I make mistakes. I may say things that are, sound wonky to you, and it may just because I don't know how to vocalize them properly. Whatever the fact is, if you have a question, call me. Call me. Either do something on, on the Facebook page there, or on the website, which again is www.hotrodbiblestudy.com. I'd be happy, happy and uh, any time to do that. Uh, and I want you all to know that I continue to keep you in prayer. I know there are a number of you out there right now that are going some, through some uh, real difficult struggles. Know that you're loved. Know that you're being prayed for. And with that, I'd like to close with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>